Welcome everybody. My name is Kenan Omertag. I'm a reproductive endocrine and infertility specialist here at the Washington University School of Medicine. I'm the second year medical student course director in OBGYN, and I'm going to be talking to you today about fertility treatment. This is the second volume of a video series. The first volume focused on the fertility workup and infertility workup. The second part will talk about the treatment of fertility and infertility. This second part is going to be broken up into three parts. The first part will talk about agents for ovulation and superovulation, broken up into specific agents like clomiphene citrate, letrozole, metformin, and gonadotropin, specifically recombinant FSH and human menopausal gonadotropin. The asterisk here next to metformin is to designate that metformin has historically been used or has been thought to be an agent for ovulation. We've learned that it is more of an adjunct and not a primary treatment, but its role in its discussion is important nonetheless. The second part of this series is gonna focus on assisted reproductive technologies, specifically in vitro fertilization and intracytoplasmic sperm injection, as well as other technologies like pre-implantation genetic testing. So we'll talk about uh, those technologies in part two. We'll wrap up with part three. That will focus on third-party reproduction, specifically the use of an egg or sperm donor at when one decides to build their family or uh, the use of gestational and or the use of gestational carriers. So we'll focus on those elements of third-party reproduction. Lesson number one, agents for ovulation induction, superovulation, specifically clomiphene citrate, also known as clomid, letrozole, and then gonadotropins. And again, we will talk about metformin. So again, we, whenever we think about agents of ovulation induction, we have to review our HPO axis. So again, remember, at the beginning of a woman's cycle, the pituitary sends a signal in the form of a hormone called FSH to recruit follicles that are sitting here in the ovaries. And those follicles will respond to the FSH, and one follicle will ultimately dominate and make estradiol. That estradiol feeds back to the brain, tells the brain to basically, hey, stop sending this FSH hormone. I don't need this anymore. And as the estrogen level starts to rise in the mid to late follicular phase, that sends a positive feedback signal to the brain to then send LH. So this E2 rise sends a signal back to the pituitary, sends a signal back to the hypothalamus, which then tells the pituitary to send this LH signal. The LH signal precedes ovulation by about 36 to 48 hours. After the LH surge, 36 to, so put another way, 36 to 48 hours after the LH surge, the egg is released and or ovulated. Timing intercourse around the time of the LH surge allows sperm to be present in the genital tract, essentially waiting for the egg for fertilization to occur in the tube. Fertilized egg then will travel here and either implant or it will not implant. The structure that's left over is called a corpus luteum. And again, this is review. We've talked about this before, but it's important again to refresh. The corpus luteum makes progesterone, also known as P4. And that progesterone will be made for two weeks. If an embryo implants, it will start making HCG and tell the corpus luteum to continue to make progesterone. If no embryo implants, then the corpus luteum will, will never get that rescue signal, will stop making progesterone, and the withdrawal of the progesterone will cause a period, and the whole thing will start over again. Clomiphene works by basically, these drugs, what we're going to be talking about is drugs, clomiphene, letrozole, gonadotropins. These drugs work to manipulate and or amplify the HPO axis. In patients who do not ovulate, they need these drugs to help induce ovulation. For patients who already ovulate but may need a boost or may need to help uh, super ovulate them to increase their monthly fecundability, these drugs can also be helpful. So these drugs serve two purposes. They help induce ovulation and they help super ovulate patients. That's important when we move, when we talk about what the indication is for the medication that you're giving. So let's first talk about clomiphene citrate or clomid. So clomid works 
again, if we refresh, let's think about how the natural cycle works. Brain sends a signal to the ovary in the form of a hormone called FSH. FSH recruits a cohort. That cohort starts to make estrogen, which then feeds back to the brain. Clomiphene works by tricking the hypothalamus into thinking there is no estrogen around. So clomiphene is a selective estrogen receptor modulator that essentially acts as an estrogen, and when I say E2, that's estradiol. It acts as an estrogen antagonist at the level of the hypothalamus. This is central to how it works in patients for ovulation induction. So essentially what happens is the brain doesn't see any estrogen so it tells the pituitary to send more FSH. So well, for patients who take clomiphene, the goal is to get them to boost their endogenous FSH production and help someone who doesn't otherwise ovulate, ultimately ovulate and release one egg. And that's ultimately the goal of the drug. The goal ultimately is to increase the amount of endogenous FSH and secondarily LH that's produced. But obviously, this is the primary response. Also note that it does have some estrogen antagonism at the level of the uterus, which has historically been, you know, almost academically thought of as a concern because if you antagonize the estrogen receptor in the uterus, then the lining, the proliferation of the lining will be inadequate. So some have wondered. It doesn't prevent people from getting pregnant ultimately, but it is a side point that, that one should be aware of when giving clomiphene. Its clinical relevance is almost like a point of interest than a um, clinical uh, uh, deterrent. Most people do not have a thin uterine lining on clomiphene, but some people will. The problem is, is that thin lining ultimately going to catch up by the time the embryo is ready to implant? Most likely, yes. So the estrogen antagonism at the level of the uterus has a little bit of a dubious um, distinction because of its clinical relevance is still somewhat unknown. But everyone likes to talk about the academic point that it is and that clomiphene does have some estrogen action antagonism at the level of the uterus. But again, to review, its primary purpose is to block estrogen receptors at the level of the hypothalamus and as a result, you'll get an increase in FSH production, which will drive recruitment of one follicle in patients who do not ovulate, maybe even an additional two or three, and then in patients who need it for superovulation, i.e. those patients who actually already ovulate, it can also act to recruit. Its main purpose there is to recruit multiple follicles. So some of the common indications, like we talked about, are ovulation induction with PCOS being the most common type of ovulation induction. Um, ovulation dysfunction is kind of a term for people who have any kind of irregular periods that don't satisfy the criteria, the diagnostic criteria for PCOS. And then we alluded to those patients who actually ovulate regularly and have regular periods and who have perhaps unexplained infertility or even endometriosis or some other uh, non-ovulatory dysfunction. Clomiphene can act to superovulate those patients. So what ends up happening is you might get recruitment of one, two, three, four, even five follicles. And that can lead to an increase in multiple rates, which is one of the side effects of the drug. So let's come, let's talk about the side effects of the drug. So again, if it acts as an estrogen antagonist at the level of the hypothalamus, you're probably going to have some menopausal like symptoms. You're going to have hot flashes. These patients will have some mood lability. So it's important to let them know uh, these are common side effects. 30 to 40% of patients will experience them, and it may be higher. Less common, about 10%, is headache and blurry vision. Typically, if people experience these side effects, they should move on to a different drug, perhaps letrozole or even injectable medications. The big side effect here to find, to really spend a little bit of time on is the risk of multiples. So this drug can increase the risk of twins uh, to about 5 to 8%. The baseline risk of twins is probably lower than 2%, but the risk of multiples with, these, with this drug is 5 to 8%. And then there's a 1% chance of triplets, seen kind of down here at the bottom. Um, the likelihood of there being triplets or more is still 1%. So it's pretty low. Now, obviously, the patient who's 42 years old 
is less likely to have multiples than the patient who is 32 years old taking clomiphene citrate. And also the indication matters. Someone who has tw who's 28 years old who has polycystic ovarian syndrome, their risk of twins is probably five to eight percent. But someone who's 35, who has whose ovaries may not have very many follicles because they have diminished ovarian reserve, for example, who has four years of infertility, Clomid, their risk of twins is probably a little bit lower than this. But still, we cite this risk to patients of about five to eight percent. But keeping in mind the age of the patient modulates the risk of twins. Okay, so we're going to talk now about letrozole. Previously, we talked about clomiphene. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor that prevents conversion to estradiol. So its goal is to provide an indirect increase in endogenous FSH. So in, when we talked about clomid, we talked about how clomid works at the level of the hypothalamus to antagonize the estrogen receptor and as a result, pour out FSH. But with letrozole, the way letrozole works, the letrozole prevents, so you have an aromatase enzyme that's making estradiol peripherally. So the way the drug works is letrozole works to block this, okay? It blocks this. So as a result, estradiol is not made in the body peripherally. So the body detects a drop in peripheral estradiol production. And the brain detects that drop as well. And as a result, the hypothalamus detects a low level of estradiol. So as a result, it tells the pituitary to secrete more FSH. So again, the ultimate outcome of the drug is similar to Clomid in that you have a boost in endogenous FSH production. Common indications, again, are ovulation induction, PCOS, and ovulation dysfunction. And it should be reminded that 85% of patients with PCOS will ovulate on clomiphene citrate. In studies looking at letrozole, it can be as high as 90%. Historically, clomiphene has been the first-line treatment for ovulation induction in patients with PCOS, and letrozole has been a second-line treatment. That has shifted over the last four years, and I'll explain why in a second. Letrozole can also be used for superovulation, specifically in cases of unexplained infertility um, and endometriosis. In those particular cases, clomiphene and unexplained infertility is still the first line treatment. It's preferred. Same with endometriosis. But again, if patients don't tolerate it, then letrozole is not unreasonable. So in patients with PCOS specifically, the question then started to arise over the last 10 years, okay, what if we compared Clomid versus Letrozole head to head? Are they, are they equivalent in patients with PCOS? To P who gets pregnant quicker? In the past, the study outcomes looked at ovulation rates and then the secondary outcomes were pregnancy outcomes. In this particular New England Journal of Medicine article, which was a randomized controlled trial in which 300 patients were randomized to Clomid and 300 were randomized to Letrozole, they basically were looking at the live birth rate in the, during the study, in the study period. So in patients who were, the inclusion criteria were basically patients who were PCOS who met Rotterdam criteria. And what the study showed was that letrozole actually had, a, had fewer multiples, had a higher live birth rate, and was better tolerated than clomiphene. The study is from 2014. You can check it out. As a result, a lot of folks like myself, when I see a patient who meets criteria for PCOS, I use letrozole as a first line agent. Now, if they you know, had Clomid previously and had a live birth and they wanna do Clomid again, that's fine. But de novo, I just will start with letrozole. The multiple rate was about 5% compared to five to 8% with Clomid. And the side effect profile was actually better tolerated. The hot flashes were not as severe. The mood lability was not really that present. And then the, there was a little more fatigue described in this group. Um, the side effect profile was ultimately better tolerated. In patients with unexplained infertility, though, it appears that the two are equivalent. As a result, I still favor clomiphene because I anecdotally believe that it just gives me in patients with unexplained infertility where I'm trying to get them to super ovulate and try to get as recruit as many follicles as possible. I still feel like anecdotally it achieves that better than letrozole. Again, that is not based on fact. That is just based on my experience. 
studies would suggest that the clomid has a higher uh, pregnancy rate, but that is not statistically significant. So again, the data is not very uh, uh, decisive. Let's talk about metformin. I think there's a historical footnote that's worth uh, mentioning here. Metformin has constantly been used, has historically been used in patients with P PCOS primarily because of the risk, because at its core, PCOS is a, may be a disease of insulin resistance. For whatever reason, these patients have some elevated uh, insulin production that could be driving increased androgen production, which is ultimately resulting in a dysfunction in how the brain, how the hypothalamus communicates with the pituitary and ultimately how the, F the ratio of FSH to LH is not favorable for follicular recruitment. It's a vicious cycle, so no one really knows how PCOS really happens, but at its core, metformin was thought to help. So a lot, you know, in the 90s, a lot of people would give metformin for ovulation induction in women with PCOS. And, you know, it worked. I mean, people who were obese, insulin resistant, irregular periods in her suit would get pregnant, would ovulate and get pregnant. Um, so it continued to be a treatment of choice along with clomiphene. But back in 2007, the same group that did this study looking at clomid and letrozole actually did a randomized controlled trial looking at clomid, metformin, al clomid alone, metformin alone, and clomid plus metformin, and found that clomid alone had the highest success rates. It was no better than clomid plus metformin, or clomid plus metformin was no better than clomid alone, and metformin alone was inferior to clomid and clomid plus metformin. So as a result, the use of metformin as a first-line treatment for ovulation induction for patients with PCOS is not uh, appropriate anymore. So why do we still use metformin? Well, again, patients with PCOS, uh, particularly those who have irregular periods and elevated signs of hyperandrogenism and are obese and or have a family history of diabetes or screen positive for signs of insulin resistance through either a two hour glucose tolerance test or less officially a hemoglobin A1C of greater than 5.7, those people are the reason why we give metformin. So if you have signs of insulin resistance, that's a good reason to give a patient who's trying to conceive metformin, especially one who has ovulation dysfunction. So in the workup of a patient with uh, PCOS, one of the things we'll look for is signs of insulin resistance. And the preferred test is a two-hour glucose tolerance test. But that can be somewhat cumbersome, so we'll substitute that occasionally with a hemoglobin A1C. And I use a cutoff of 5.7 to start metformin. So metformin is essentially an adjunct to fertility treatment.